So now I'd like to introduce Ken Jones. He's with uh, Resource Contractors LLC, and he has got a presentation on slicers and poles. So, thank you, Ken. Yep. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, hopefully, all of you didn't come just to listen to me, because I, I hope I don't disappoint. So, <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty low key and haven't done this much, but uh, I'm usually more comfortable out in the woods. I've been working with these slicers with a company called IVC, International Veneer Company, back east, and uh, well, for about seven or eight years, uh, he would find the logs and bring them in, and I'd work them up, finish working them up, or, or uh, set them aside, and then I'd load them in containers or on flatbeds. Um, if they go on flatbeds, they go back east to their mills either in South Hill, Virginia or Pennsylvania. And they export in containers that go to uh, Shanghai, China, uh, from the west coast here anyway. And, and they're all uh, the same, same mills that uh, they have back east. They're all sliced instead of rotary uh, turned. And as soon as uh, we get some cards uh, these uh, samples here you want to just kind of pass those around that's how thin the slices are it's just business card thin it's pretty amazing when they do it and no setup that they use to to uh, make them but basically the the alder that they're looking for is as clear as possible four side clear uh, so there's no blemishes or knots that go into the the wood grain so when they do slice these out they want them to look this clear no no little knot indicators or anything to blemish the surface and they their grading uh, is like I say a number one is a four side clear where there's no uh, knot indicators and that sort of thing and a number two you can have some knot indicators or some blemishes on just one side only and then the grade drops down from that. But if everybody has these in hand, this is a real good example of a of a, a clear uh, four side, uh, no blemish tree that we can get a, a veneer block out of, which are nine sixes or ten six in length, uh, thirteen inch diameter minimums minimum on the scale end, or we can the tree can be cut into multiples of 9 foot or 10, 10 foot, uh, you know, 21s, 32s, or whatever to haul them on a conventional truck. A lot of uh, small landowners will develop a car trailer load or a dump truck load, and that's all fine because I use a shovel in my log yard to offload them, and, and it makes it handy for, you know, where you only have a few because you can get a five-acre stand of, of alder, and you might generate a dump truck load or a single log truck load of, of the quality that they're looking for. So, in the, mainly the first several pages here are just other examples of how clear the surface needs to be. Like on the second page is a real good example, along with that first one. That if you look at the bark, it's just nice and even texture. There's no bumps or black spots or, you know, black knot indicators. And then the one that I'm standing to is another example, like the first one. Is you don't see any of the what we call a beard or a black knot, which is where the limb has rotted and bro broke off, and then it, it has the, that real black knot showing where it used to be. And when they slice into that, that uh, they try to set the log up on the table to where they can maximize the number of slices they can get out of each piece before they run into a blemish. The next few pages are kind of the same thing. This is after they've been worked up at my yard. We uh, That white is a wax that we paint the ends with to kind of help control checking and, and staining and just keep the color of the wood you know, as, as natural as possible. But if you look at the surface characteristics, it's all like what I was showing you in those previous pages. Nice and smooth and straight and round and clear surface. One thing that's kind of natural when you process these in the woods is you'll get the split. You know, they just 
they'll pop open on their own, you know, and a single split across the face like that is, is acceptable. Preferably, you know, if, if both ends split, that stays in the same plane. That way when they jig it up that they can slice right into that split and recover as much as possible. And these uh, little units there that kind of hold that split together are called flick savers. They're made out of plastic so it can slice right through it without dulling the blade. And the next page is a real good close-up of what we call the black knot or a beard. And if you look at one, I wish I had a picture of one on a standing tree, but you can see where the, the limb used to be, and then underneath is all these little depression marks, and then usually you have a black angle coming down that looks like a Fu Manchu type beard coming off of that. So they're pretty noticeable from a distance. There's smaller ones and bigger ones like these. And this one here is, is you can kind of see that, what I was referring to. And then you can see the hump of, of what that knot, where it healed over and, and cleaned up. But, and on the last couple pages, you can see how it affects the interior of the, of the panel. If you look close, you can see in the stack there, like this one here, those are all stacked these thin slices in one big stack there. So they get several stacks, or, or, for, for several slices off of each log, and they, they, you know, they're always looking for a 13 inch minimum or bigger that just makes a wider panel and, and more panels uh, per log. Because these here, this would fall into a, a, a rustic piece, which are lower value, but this is what that knot, you can see where the bump is on, you know, on both of these. And then that's what it looks like back inside the wood once they slice it open. And what they can do with this is, is they do a, a clip, or they clip those out on both ends so they can wind up with a shorter, clear panel. But it, it cuts the value in half for, because they're looking for those longer, longer panels. Well, they're just put back together for presentation, and, and each log it, that's represents uh, a flitch of one log. So they keep track of it all through the system after they've put it together like that. That way they can grade the log and then track back where it came from. And it, yeah, and so they can call me and tell me, you know, that that number two was really a rustic piece. <laughs> but... Uh, and normally they, they try to target, you know, the highest percentage they can on the clear wood if it's a number one, but realistically they're only recovering about 60% at best for the, the, what they're targeting for. So there's a fair amount of fall down and loss of value. So it's pretty critical to try to get the best, the cleanest piece in the woods or, you know, at my yard where I, before I load them out and pay for it. Pardon? Uh, that I'm not real sure, but I know when the load gets down to their their mill, they go into water bath of 100 some degrees, and it's in there for I think seven days soaking. So when they pull them out and then uh, set them up on the table and slice them, th these pieces are almost transparent where you can almost see through them. They're you know still saturated with water so much, but. Pardon? Yeah, yeah. Can you yeah. So we can... Oh yeah. The the question was uh, on the, on the drying part. I'm not sure if they uh, they I've, I've never had that question asked, but <laughs> I uh, haven't asked it myself. To, but they must dry them through a, a kiln, I would guess, uh, because. I think the customers come in and they pick out their bundles and I would assume that they're ready to ship, you know, packaged up and ready to ship. So they, they must be dried. Uh, I know some of these that I have sitting in my shop, they'll start warping a little bit because I just got them sitting out on their own and, and not packaged up or anything. But the, uh, the water bath that they do also, it sets the color of the, of the sheets once they slice it. 
So it, there's no special chemical or anything they use necessarily, but it's, it's, I think it's a company secret how they do it and how long determines the color. Because uh, they've had some wood go through that was either too old or, you know, for some process reason, it turned out almost bleach white, and that was, they wasted the whole, the whole vat load. Which a, a load of uh, logs that are in the vats that I'm talking are about like 5,000 board feet per, per charge that they process through at a time. Question, how, how, how long after they're sliced, Mm -hmm. I mean, did they have to be stickered or anything like other timber? I mean, what? I don't think so. I, you yeah, know, through the, could. yeah, through the drying process, you know, all I've seen is just stacks them like this. They go through a clip line and when they're on by themselves and then they're stacked in accordingly to grade and that. But, so I don't think, I don't know That's what they'd use to sticker them. So, I yes. Can help you a little bit. They go through a veneer dryer you know, shortly after they slice it. Oh, the, okay. Yeah, and then it comes through there. It takes, uh, you know, a few minutes to pass through it, and then they take it from there. Thank you. That's very similar. You can come up here and help me out a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's, the thick, what's the thickness of the slice? The thickness of the slice? Well, I don't know, but you can, if you got one of these, well, that's, that's pretty thin. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 25, 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah. How do, how do you ship the logs to where it gets processed? Is it on a truck or a... Yeah, it's, it's on a, the question how I how they're shipped from in log form. And if they're going back east, I put them on a flatbed. And I basically just put a layer down. They'll uh, put a gut wrap strap on them to hold those. And I pyramid them up. And uh, there's like 13 to 14 pieces per stack, four stacks on the trailer. And that's, they, they tarp them, and then the way, way they go. If they're going overseas, they go in a sealand container. And I'll stack a stack of them in the end as far as I can get them in there, because, you know, the, without pinching your hoses and that sort of thing, they'll stick it out. And I'll make the whole stack, and then I got a pusher that I use, and I shove it in. I do that three times to get the load, uh, the number of pieces. Usually about 63 to 75 pieces per container is what a, a full, be a full load. Is there a difference in the quality between what goes to the East Coast and what goes to China? Used to be, but now the, they want a better product too. So oh. it's, it's pretty much the same, same quality uh, in demand. Uh, you know, not all wood goes to China. There's uh, some shipments will go to Vietnam, uh, Germany, you know, pretty much global anymore. But uh, um, I probably send more overseas than I do back east. The back east of the mills, they do a lot of other East Coast hardwoods, you know, elm and oak and poplar. I, I mean, almost everything they'll, they'll slice. But uh, so they... From the West Coast Alder, it takes a you know a week to get back there, and it'll sit in their yard for a week or so if they can't fit it into their their cut right away. So uh, the the time frame of especially going into the summer months is crucial because these will stain, and once they've stained from the heat, they've lost almost the whole piece. If they can clip them back from the ends. And salvage anything, but uh, that's real risky because we're we're looking at uh, a minimum of two week turnaround here from once they're cut to where I can get them on a truck, plus a week of shipment, and then hopefully a week or less of sitting there on their blacktop cooking the whole time until they can get them into their water vat and, and start processing them. But explain this uh, machine this. Uh, these. Yeah, the machine that slices these, it's, if you can imagine, that they'll take one of these logs and they'll, they'll slice a flat edge on one side. And they'll put it up against this table, it's, it's a huge table, probably about as big as this wall, and maybe this, this long to the corner. And they'll put it up against that log, and it does have a couple of dogs to start with, but there's also a strong vacuum holding it. So as they, the table starts working in and it slices, 
that it gets lighter and then they can release those dogs and just the vacuum holds it so they can slice right up to the very end piece to the table. And on the, the table, the, in front of that is, is where there's, they have conveyors after it's sliced, the slice piece runs off. But at a slight angle, there's a razor sharp blade that's about 10 or 12 feet long and it's stationary and it's, it's at an angle like this so when the table comes in it actually moves up and down this way and each slice goes all the way through <coughs> slices one of these this thin and it slides out the table moves in that same thickness until the logs completely gone so it's, it's pretty impressive I, <coughs> I've seen a short video of that it, the full length. Yeah. If, if the if the log is 13 inches, it it strokes through 13 plus inches to make sure it goes like all the, the way through. The log. Yeah, the whole yeah, length of the log. Not like a block plane where it runs no. the length of the log. Okay. No, no, the log is is stationary on this table, and the whole table moves up and down this way and inches forward. You know, every whatever 30 seconds this is, <laughs> but. Uh, uh, then from there it runs out and then they'll look at the panels and start grading it and it, they'll either pull some into the clip line if they have to cut defect out or that sort of thing from that point. Now, do you have to worry about bruising? Uh, not really. Uh, the, the manufacturing heads that are used today on alder works fine for the veneer. It, it, nothing goes in, you know, there's no pressure that, that stains the wood in, into the fiber or anything like that. Uh, what they really refrain from is, you know, grapples, pinching, and gouging, like if you fell against a stump and pulled some wood out. You know, you've, you've lost, if it's in that much, you lost an opportunity of several slices until you get that cleaned up. Did you take the bark off first? Uh, the, yeah, the bark comes off, and I, and I believe the bar bark comes off before it goes into that water bath. And then, uh, and then it goes right into the mill from that water bath. Got pressurized? Uh, not in the water bath. It's not pressurized. No, it, it's just uh, at a temperature. I think it's like 120 degrees, and held that for like seven days. You work with other species? Uh, not out here. No, just just alder. Yeah. Well, most all the other species are, you know, back east. I know they've gone into South America at times and, and bought some wood, but no, no, I, they do do maple back east, but uh, yeah. So all the processing uh, is on the east coast. Uh, there is a processing operation in Idaho. I don't know the name of the company. Yeah, and, and there's a few other back east, you know, mid Midwest or back east. Yes. What's it going to take to get them to work with maple, our maple? Uh, that I don't know. Is there a problem with the, <coughs> the uh, stringiness of the maple or something? Slide, or? It's a harder wood, isn't it? Yeah, it's a harder wood, but uh, I don't know if it may be the color change in, you know, from the sap to heart. There's quite a bit of vari variation of that here. I don't know if the back east, the, the, the maple they have back east uh, has that issue or not. You know, I, I'm not that involved in that whole process and, th and that part of it to really answer correctly for sure, but, yes? The loss of the ash back east, the ash board, even interest in the ash out here, is that A little bit. Uh, they've never, they haven't bought any out here. Can't find a straight one. But, yeah. There <laughs> <laughs> are enough of it, I guess, to make it worthwhile. You know, usually you, you come across a patch of ash and, you know, a couple loads is about all you're going to get, and it's, you know, that's, but, yeah, that ash borer really has devastated the eastern area. Nobody's asked a key question, how much do you pay compared to uh, <laughs> 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 the Chip prices. <laughs> well, right now, we're, we're substantially higher. Uh, right now, what I'm paying for uh, a Number one or a four side clear is seventeen hundred dollars a thousand. Seventeen hundred a thousand. And number two, which is a three side clear, is sixteen hundred a thousand. And then if I have a rustic or a, a twelve inch log that is perfectly clean four side, those are both at around a thousand dollars a thousand right now. 
and and that rustic piece that I'm buying right now is only because we do have a market currently that they're trying to to build so I, I'm trying to generate a couple container loads and and see how that progresses and hopefully we can have that as a long-term thing because it's it's really handy when you're trying to find a one or two you're always going to have a rustic piece with it so yes Yeah, the question is how heat affects this and what we might be able to do about it. But coming into the late spring where temperatures start hitting 80 degrees plus consistently or being out in the sun, uh, you know, for long periods of time after the tree is cut, it just, the, that red, those red speckles and stuff start, I'm sure you've all seen it, start showing up on the ends. And you can cut a piece and it looks perfect and two hours later if it's going to get that stain it, it shows up right away but after the the pieces that don't aren't stained or whatever even when I wax them if they sit in my log yard for any length of time with with temperatures that are 85 90 degrees for a week time chances are I need to trim the ends to make sure it didn't stain before I can send it we've lost the one a couple of years back, we had two loads ready, stacked up, ready to go. And before we could get the containers lined up, a couple of weeks went by and we lost both loads for the company did. So it was basically just firewood at that point because the mills don't want a 10 foot or nine foot log. Um, if they take them, you're not getting recovery any of the wood or the value or you just paid out for it. But so it's a big loss. But but so far, the, the only thing that we can do, like at my log yard, I have a bunch of trees on the one side that I work up the alder. And if I can keep them in the shade and never let the sun get to them where it's a little bit cooler, I can, I can buy a few days and that. So when I go out to, and look at wood uh, so coming into this time of the year, um, I try to work it out with the loggers or landowners to where we can cut those and I'll identify the trees so we can target those trees and try to get them cut into my yard where I can get them in a can within two weeks or less. That, that's the best we can do right now because, like I say, we add another week of travel time and then, uh, you know, however long before they can get them in the, the uh, water bath and then, then they're okay at that point if they haven't lost it yet. But. Does that mean you're not going to be buying in August? Probably, unless we can work that short window of operation. There is one company a few years ago, I sold a load, it, it didn't seem to matter to him as much, and I, I worked up a load in the summer months and he bought it. And if it, how it turned out, I didn't hear, but it, it's pretty critical, which is the ideal time for anybody to log alder is in the dry season. So it's a double-edged sword working against, uh, you know, that product. So, um, when, you, when you paint the ends, when do I paint the ends? As soon as it hits the ground. Uh, no, I usually once it gets to my yard, uh, because I have a process. I first I, I look them all over and I I clean them up and uh, do some remanding if I have to, and then I uh, uh, scale them, tag them, scale them, flitch them, and then once I've recorded all the the scale and, and recorded everything, then I wax them the very last thing but it's usually the same day that or that I start the load with one or two days when they get delivered to my yard so they're they're ready to go yeah right yes now when I worked with uh, Greg Franklin yeah um, he came out before I even cut the tree uh -huh. and uh, we tagged the ones that looked good and then he came out after they were dead Right. And then he came out and wrote me a check while they were loading them. Yeah. So do you do that, come out, like, are this, is this really uh, going to be a good slicer or not before I even cut it? Or That's what I prefer to do. Oh, good. Even, even more than, you know, I know he, he tried to do that as much as he could, but he had a lot of other place to go. But I almost insist on looking at the trees before they're cut. Yeah. Because you can see a lot of these indicators a lot easier when you walk around the tree. 
and any other like there's uh, like little clusters of uh, epicormal type limbs that are yeah. you know you you can accept a few of those but you don't want a big clump of them because uh, usually the epicormal little limbs are little green shoots they only go in about a half an inch or so and they have it rooted down into the the tree like these more dominant limbs have but I'll, I'll do that I'll walk the stand I'll mark every tree that I see a lot of times I'll put one band if it's just a one block or multiple bands if there's two or three and like I say we can we can leave them full length if you got a way to haul it with a truck uh, it's easier to, to handle them you know longer logs and load them you can get more volume on a on a load and then I reman them when they get into the yard uh, then I've done that too to where if there's room on the landing we can work them up right there. We can put the flitch savers in, tag them and that. But a lot of times you're working on the ground or something, so you don't have skids that make it a little easier to paint the wax on, that sort of thing. But And the one difference between me doing it and Greg, Greg is the end user, user and he walks around with a checkbook. Mm -hmm. I have to put everything together, invoice the company, and then they, the payment comes from them. So. I try to do a two-day mailing turnaround, so I try to get the money, you know, payment of a, you know, a week to two weeks maximum, but I try to target a week turnaround for payment, so. And then one real quick question, how many, what's the minimum number of logs you'll pay, a 10-foot log you'll pay? The minimum number? All right, now I haven't found anybody that can produce more than we can sell, so. <laughs> okay, so uh, I say I got... 10 or 20 logs, that's okay. Oh yeah, sure. Oh, yeah. That's that's only a partial load. I, right. Usually, uh, if it's going container, I'm, I'm looking for around 5,500 to 5,700 board feet in the load. So, and that's usually, depending on the size of diameters, you know, 65 to 75 pieces. On a flat bed, it can't haul as much just for the way they're loaded. They don't use stakes to stack them in. And usually, a r average of 14 per stack, uh, so you know, 55 to 60 pieces. That pretty much gets a flatbed up to legal weight to, okay. to go on the highways, 80,000 pounds. So, but yeah, uh, anytime uh, you you have alder of size, and the critical part is measure a few of your trees and and try to hit that 13 inch, at least in your first block. You know. Uh, you can kind of eyeball it, you can measure something or use a circumference or whatever to kind of determine that. Because we want to buy uh, no more than, say, 10% of a 12-inch diameter because, there's, you know, they're just so, so narrow of, of panels. Yeah. And, and they're basically these customers, you know, they're using them for cabinetry like that and stuff. And the, more, the wider the panel, the better it is. How big can you go? Is there a limit on all this? Nah, uh, we've we got one real nice log from a little job in Olympia. It was uh, 24 on the scale in, and that was 30 feet. Or, I'm sorry, that was a 20, 21 footer. So we got two blocks out of it, and it was uh, I think 28 inches on the butt. I've seen some logs up to 30, 32, but. Once you start getting that big, a lot of times the trees are over mature. You might start getting red heart possibly or, uh, you know, that sort of thing. But Minimum would be 13. Yeah. Typical, most average diameter is probably average 14, 15 inches. You know, you will, we'll get a few uh, 16, 18, a few 20 footer or 20 inches, but majority is right in that 14 to 16 inch diameter range. And Where do you that, see the price going um, with alder? Well, on the veneer, we're probably, we've never paid more. Well, we paid, on, on my end of things, I've paid it up to 1800 a 1000 That's when alder saw logs was pushing $1,000, 1000 So there's still a fair margin there. But the biggest thing, I think, on small landowners, if you have enough to really deal with it you know and the extra handling and care that you might take and that's something I can kind of determine if I come out and look at it too you know if, if you're only going to get four or five pieces it's hardly worth it you know when you're going to have six to eight truckloads you know to the mill yeah do you 
got an average age on a 13 inch diameter? Uh, no. I, there's probably people in this room that uh, know that a lot better than me. <laughs> the older yeah, I would have to say so. I'd, I'd say, you know, 40 years or so or better. you think it'd be possible to propagate that by pruning? Yeah, yeah. The question is if to, to enhance that uh, growth and, and quality. I don't know of anybody that has done it on a large scale. I, I know a few tree farmers down south that have done that with poles and everything else, you know. And and all there would be no exception. I, the sooner you can prune something and get that nice clean wood, is it's it's better for several species. So, but it takes a lot of a lot of time and effort to do it. I suppose alder might be the easiest because there's less limbs than on a fir tree. <laughs> <So>. yeah, <laughs> trying to think. Uh, I guess that's unless you've got more questions. I think I covered most everything about <coughs> it. Uh, but the the key thing, like I say, is uh, you know on uh, harvesting it is uh, you know if you think you got something, give me a call. Uh, I'll be more than happy to come out and take a look at it. Is there any kind of ring count associated with these? Not really, no. Uh, I mean, the more even grain it is, the better, but usually, uh, you know, we've we've cut a lot of blocks that had pretty wide, you know, fast growth in it off the... Is there a time that you just really don't buy? Summertime. <laughs> <laughs> summertime. Yeah. The only time you buy in the summertime if you can really get it down to figure it out then move it quickly to That's if, the only time. Otherwise, you don't even yeah, I I wouldn't. I would definitely call first, and then I'll say, well, I got a market. I got I'm looking for a container. This guy's willing to buy the wood. Let's move it right now. But the the, the biggest problem is that a lot of private landowners or you know smaller uh, tree farmers aren't going to have enough of volume of that quality to make a full load of themselves. So I really, really cut back in the, in the beginning of the hot season on these six, eight, ten piece loads. I'm looking for a Port Blakely that has a whole load in one truckload. You know, the the mule trains that come in off the, these jobs like that produce a little more than one full load at, at a trip, and so it's you can work it up and move it out real quick. Uh, yeah, that's it's. The bad thing is is the the heat, and coming in through let's see this we're coming into April Hill here real soon. May is right there to where if we're not having cool weather and some rain or something, we better start curtailing small production lots, you know, and go for a little more volume. If I know I have several landowners that are going to bring in enough pieces at the same time, but that's that's really tough to to manage. Yes. Storage where you could either have it in a pond, in a medium with sprinklers on it or something. Yeah. Hold it. That would that would help. Uh, but anymore, I'm I'm not going to set up sprinklers to uh, have the Department of Ecology or anybody else come out and start telling me that all this runoff is going to, you know, a salamander or something down <laughs> off the property. So, but. Uh, storage ponds or something, uh, you know, a uh, vacant uh, gravel pit, some of those, you know, we, we've talked about it, but I don't know if putting them in a water bath that's uncontrolled might stain the wood and you might lose that, the coloring, you know, that it might put in just from being in there. I, I don't know. Yeah. You know, I, I was talking to a few of those guys at Cascade Hardwood, and and they've opened some of those up, and it looks really nice. And we we were talking to them about generating some slicers from some of their decks, but it it just it hasn't, happened. hasn't happened. Yeah, and and most of their volume that they process is not looking for a high grade piece of material, 
to start with. So, well, if we can kind of wrap up the alder thing, if anybody has a question later, that's fine. I'll be more than happy to answer. But also wanted to touch base on on pole production a little bit. Uh, my my main job is is uh, I'm procurement manager for the southwest region for Osier Pole Company out of Bellingham to uh, procure uh, both cedar and fir poles. Mainly down here I'm looking for transmission fir poles 65 feet and longer primarily. Um, so pri private tree farmers are a good source for some good quality stands and age you know for the type of timber and poles that I'm uh, looking for is probably 60 to 85 years old is, is kind of ideal for the, the butt size to match the length and the top size for the transmission poles that we try to produce. Um, our, our company has one treating retort. It's a, just a small operation, nothing like uh, McFarland or Stella Jones uh, produces mass quantities weekly. We uh, quite a bit smaller than that. So uh, there's myself and one one other pole buyer that works out of the main office uh, in Bellingham. He covers most of the area from about Monroe up north, and I'll I'll travel up to Monroe or Port Angeles uh, to either buy buy or look at uh, timber sales that the DNR puts up, or uh, governments like uh, Fort Lewis or local. Uh, governments you know that might put up uh, uh, some little regional sales or something like that but and I go out the same as I would with Alder I go out and look at the stands try to appraise how much pole volume might be in there for the landowner and the value and, and look at the size and look for defect and educate those that have never dealt with poles same with the Alder it's always I always get this uh, people apologize for wasting my time coming and looking at what they don't have but it's never never a waste of time it's an education for everybody you get to meet different people and that sort of thing so it's that's the kind of the, the fun part of the, of the business is you know we're all looking at the same thing trying to return money into your pocket and, and make a nice product so the, there's specifications on poles that slightly vary from cedar uh, cedar is actually more lenient than fir poles but just the way it is, uh, the way they grow and that sort of thing. But uh, most of what we produce uh, goes back east, uh, some by truck, but a lot of by rail. Uh, we do sell some wood uh, untreated to our competitors at time. If they need have a big order and they don't have the sizes, they'll, they'll buy from us and vice versa. But we deal strictly with uh, Douglas fir and uh, Western Red Cedar. We do do a little bit of yellow cedar, uh, not very often, but is uh, any, any, uh, you go ahead. Are cedar poles also utility poles? Yeah, same thing. The utility poles, transmission poles, it's, uh, to break it down a little bit, utility poles are shorter and just for, you know, small streets and you know, homes off the main transmission lines, and that, that's the name, the transmission poles carry a heavier load. Can hear, carry more are interchangeable? Yeah, yeah. They're they're both used for the same application. Uh, primarily, cedar uh, is used more in a, a wetter climate, or uh, uh, it, just, it just depends on the, the the power companies and what how they engineer their their lines that they're going to put up. If they want to specify pine, cedar, or fir. Um, so far, the, the wood pole is still cheaper and, and, and more versatile than, than metal poles or fiberglass that they use, and you'll, you'll see around quite a bit of But uh, Today, they've improved the technology to the point that they can extend the life of a treated pole by several years. They'll go out and they'll drill holes and put treated plugs in that actually release more chemical in the ground line area primarily. They'll go up if you got a bad spot in a pole and birds might have started pecking out some of the wood. They'll clean that out and they'll put a poly patch in there to extend the life of it. So little things like that to extend the value of, of the product. You need a 65 foot tall pole. That's kind of what you said. Yeah. What kind of a diameter as a rule? 
for okay for for to determine what class and the size the the pole uh, tree needs to be for a certain <coughs> class and length um, on average a 65 footer will need a, like a 17 inch diameter butt and an 8 to 10 inch top so there's some uh, yeah yeah or inside the bark or the bark off yeah there is a circumference at six feet that all poles are determined the class that they are for the length. So there is a little criteria. It's maybe not the best place to go through all the different classes, but they, they are classed by the, the circumference at six feet, no matter how long the pole is. And then the top size also helps determine that as well. So if you have a tree that's super tapered, Chances are you would the butt will tell you you can go 80 feet, but once you go out say 60 feet, you're you're running out of top diameter to match the butt. And the other way, if you have a stove pipe, you know you're you're going to have an oversized top for what the butt is going to let you have, which typically is the way it goes. But uh, and so what we try to do is to manage that so we're not buying lots of extra volume for a particular class pole that we can only sell so much for so but most trees are fairly uniform in taper and, and pretty well con conforms to the the class and length for the tops they go into the yard you have on the last card you ship them uh, occasionally uh when i was set up a little better i had the room i would buy some wood from south you know like woodland and clamor or something like that then the landlord could bring it up up to my yard and I would look them over, reman them if I need to, get them scaled by the bureau and have them all set to go and then tag them and then just put them on a truck and then they go up to the yard from there and then uh, they go through the rest of the process there and, and the landowner we get paid based on the scale that what I scaled them at, uh, at on Alaska. So. What do you pay then for those? Well, right now the average price varies from say eleven hundred to thirteen hundred dollars a thousand, depending on you know say forties to long transmission. It kind of varies from job to job, stand to stand, and different different things that uh, I can negotiate with the landowners for trucking or, or whatever and delivery. You know, I, a lot of times I I might buy the wood on the landing and pay for the trucking. It just it kind of varies so. It's not a set price that I have. Ring count? Yeah, uh, there is a minimum ring count. Uh, uh, try to hit, uh, I think it's like six inches to the inch, or five inches to the inch. Uh, I think it's five inches actually, but uh, smaller poles are for when they're young. You know, they're still growing, so they have wider rings. Usually the transmission poles, the older trees, are, there's no, no real issue. The issue that you do have is sap. You've got to have a minimum of three quarters of an inch of sap wood for the treatment to, to go in that far for the longevity that they design these poles for and, and what they expect the life of it. Uh, most generally, the, everything is usually has ample sap wood, you know, two to three inches sometimes. So, like I say, if you have too much sap, it's easier for too much oil to go in, so it costs us. It's getting over treated. But when you have thin sap, uh, even even sometimes you might have enough sap wood that is legal, but occasionally there's times where the oil will just won't penetrate the cells. It goes through a process seasoning cycle to, to expel all the, the moisture that's in the cells, and then the oil and treatment will replace that. But sometimes cells collapse or some, something like that, and it won't allow the, the penetration all the way. So they're, they're quality sampled, you know, with cores and, and have, you know, individual inspectors that come out and check for that before they're actually shipped off. But we had a question back. Is there a price difference between the, the current cedar poles? Yeah, cedar poles are a fair more pricey. Uh, you know, we always try to stay above the, the markets that, you know, cedar markets versus fur markets and the mills and that. But uh, uh, typically the cedar prices will run two to three hundred dollars a thousand more than the fur will on almost any given length you know and in, in the classes that they are so yeah uh there's to, 
try to keep it short, you know, there's uh, on fir poles, the fir trees, you have whirls of limbs that kind of grow in whirls. Cedar, they're always usually staggered. So there's very, very seldom you have too many limbs on a cedar pole. On a fir pole, you have a sum of knots in a one foot lineal section. And it's broken down into the length of the pole of how many knots you're allowed and how, how big the knot can be. That's one thing. It's easier for me to look at your tree and, and talk about that. But if you have a trouble looking up through your limbs because they're too big or there's so many of them and there's whirls, you know, all the way around, it's not going to be a pole. <laughs> uh, do we, you can't have uh, spike knots, you know, uh, limbs that grow out at an angle. Uh, those are, are prohibited. One of the main reasons for that is the spike knot, once it's, it's cut off and, and say it goes through the seasoning cycle, there's, there's a lot of times there's a bark that stays on that limb that gets grown in, bark inclusion. And what happens a lot of times that through the treating process, the high, high temperatures and pressure, it can blow what bark might be in there out. That'll leave that <laughs> void space. So when it's in service, rains, the water will collect in there and, and get stagnant, draw bugs, and, and pretty soon you get a rotten section. And, and the, the pole fails. But there's several other defects, that, but uh, that's, that's some of the main ones. Straightness. Uh, you don't want double sweep, you can have some sweep, but basically an imaginary line center to center from top to butt. If it stays within the surface, it's straight enough to make the spell. So do you come out and look at the stand and say, hey, I'll buy that one or this one and this one would work, and then get it to your yard and say, no, it won't work? And then it'll be <laughs> well, if I, I don't pull the money out of my pocket, but what I will do is guarantee that I look at them because there is a hidden de defect and a lot of that is caused from driving other trees on top of which is called driven knot and or break, you know, fall break if the bark is intact where you can't see it type thing. Those are almost impossible to see but I'll guarantee what I buy on the landing that I've looked at. I've eaten poles because of my word if it's, if it I didn't see anything wrong with it, and that's one reason I like looking at the stand first to identify any defect. Because if you have snow break in there, it's going to be pretty much consistent throughout your stand in the same area to where you need. So you can either take a log off, get a pole above it, or just bypass it and go to the next one. And, and that's where I, I spend the time to, if I mark your stand for poles, I've pretty well looked it over good enough, it's, unless I miss something. but. But yeah, uh, we do what I do a lot of times on the fall down if something gets through and it works out to where we'll set those logs apart, you know, aside and we generate a load. You can have it delivered to wherever your other saw logs are going or we'll pay a fair market price minus a little bit for our handling costs. So it's not a total, total loss. But I try to minimize that as much as possible. I, I try to, if I have one piece on a load that was kicked out, it's on me for not looking at them close enough. And we've done a real good track record between me and the other buyer of, of having every, you know, 100% load of uh, pieces on the load being acceptable. They might have to cut a few back, you know, five or 10 feet to clean up something. But we can, we can do that because the volume that we generate is enough that we can stay on top of it, babysit the jobs to where, you know, a lot of stuff is not just shoved through and dealt with later. Did a processor damage your pole? Usually no. Uh, the only time is if we're handling cedar poles and the pressure on the, on the heads are a little bit out of adjustment and they get hung up and those feed rolls will chew into a cedar real quick. <laughs> they'll, they'll do it in fur too, but and that's kind of critical. You, you don't want to go too deep even on the fur. But most cases, the operators are well enough. And, and you know, if, if the tree is too limby, a chance are it's not a pole. And that's usually what kind of holds things up. But if we're working through the processor. How do the loggers feel? How, does, how do most of the loggers feel about having it? When you come in and take the poles out before they log? 
Well, a lot of times we don't take them out beforehand. Like we, we, I worked with Weyerhaeuser for a lot of years, and we tried to develop pre-pole operation. And some of them work. Not all applications are going to work for poles. And I'll be the first to admit that, you know, you got some poles here, but you know, there's not enough to mess with. It's a hassle sometimes to get a long 100-foot piece out of certain areas, especially if you're trying to leave some stands you know, some residual. You don't want to bark them up. You know, a lot of different things involved. But uh, for the most part, there's added value in it. And if there's only one load out of, you know, 10 or 20 acres, it may not be worth to mess with one load. But I try to look at a stand where we have 10 Ten percent or more in the stand is worth worth going after. Thank you, Thank you.